Okay. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, thank you, Summer Sessions and Lifelong Learning, and, of course, the Institute of Arctic Biology for employing me for a couple decades and also inviting me here to talk today. So we're going to talk about the interactions between people and wildlife. And when I think about this, I think about a big complex puzzle, right? You have a bunch of pieces that are different wildlife species, and you have a bunch of pieces that are people doing different activities, right? And there's all sorts of different interactions. But what makes this really exciting but also sometimes frustrating is because our social and our ecological environment are changing so fast right now, as you're putting the puzzle together, the pieces keep changing shape, right? So right when you think you understand the big picture, everything's changing. So tonight, I'm going to tell a few stories about some of these puzzle pieces and the way that they interact. Um, I'm going to specifically focus on big changes in our natural environment and the implications on, on how people and wildlife are interacting. And just to give you an idea of where we're going here, I'm going to start up in northern Alaska, and then the story is going to finish in interior Alaska. Okay. And before I begin, um, the different research projects I'm going to talk about were, of course, I had a ton of help. A lot of funding, a lot of collaborators with a lot of different state and federal agencies um, that all participate in this. And then, of course, I'm going to be talking about a lot of work that my lab here at UAF works on. It's the Alaska Human Dimensions of Wildlife Lab that has had and still has a bunch of great graduate students helping me do, these, uh, do this important work. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been around... Uh, here for about 21 years. My wife and I are raising two uh, uh, great boys about 14 miles northwest of town. We homesteaded this area through a borough auction and we've pretended to be farmers and ranchers when we're, we're not doing our day jobs over the years. So there's Aaliyah and then my, my sons Ivor and Knox who are now 11 and 8 so they've changed. But for my uh, work, what I do is, is I look at the different interactions between people and wildlife and the environment. So to understand these systems, you have to know a little bit about each one of these components, right? And how they interact. But what's really important is try to understand how these things change over time and what is driving those changes. Now, the wildlife profession, kind of as a formalized field, started in the 1930s and since then has really concentrated on this wildlife and environment interactions, right? For a long time, we largely ignored the people component. But in the late 1990s, I think we realized this is really important. If you all were to close your eyes, maybe for just five, ten seconds, and think about a wildlife problem, I'm going to give you just a couple seconds here. Okay, now I want you to think, is this actually a wildlife problem, or is this a human problem related to wildlife? It's highly likely that either people are part of the cause or if they're not, they're, they're part of the solution. So it's really important to consider that, that human component in these systems. So I bet I devote probably half of my time to doing more traditional wildlife biology as we know it, and then the other half focusing on this human dimensions. And I would just kind of generally define that as how people affect or are affected by wildlife. So many of you are probably aware that last year was globally the warmest on record. In fact, we have to go back 47 years before we've actually had a, had a year that is cooler than the average that we've had since 1850. So we haven't had really a cold year as compared to that long-term record for a very long time. And in fact, if you look at the last, just kind of the last few decades, the last 23 out of 24 years have been the warmest on record. So I'm putting on this yellow line up, and that's kind of the temperature from the normal there. And you can see only 1998 was warmer than, the, than since 2001. So things are changing globally, but they're especially changing in the Arctic. So the Arctic environment is warming three to four times faster than the global average. So we are really experiencing change. And as I mentioned, I've only been up here for 21 years. So all I really know is kind of a balmy Alaska as compared to those that have lived here for a long time. So this is kind of the big change, the big shift in the natural environment that we're going to focus on is climate change and climate-related change in the environment. 
So if we start up in the north, one very evident change that has occurred is the loss of sea ice. Not just sea ice extent, but also sea ice thickness. So this chart kind of shows since the uh, late 1970s all the way up to today how the minimum sea ice extent has changed. The minimum usually occurs in September or something like that, and this is millions of square kilometers. But if we put a trend line through that, we've lost about 13% uh, decline per decade since 1980. And so one thing, of course, that I think a lot about is how does this impact wildlife and how does this impact people? I mean, can we think of one species that might be really impacted by this sea ice change? There we go, absolutely. Uh, sea ice is critical habitat for polar bear. So as that sea ice extents has declined, what we're seeing is, is this species is forced to spend a lot more time on land. In fact, if we just look at the Southern Beaufort Sea population, so that's the population that kind of exists all along the north coast up there. This is the percent of the population that is on shore. And if we go back to the 80s, we can see like less than 10% of the population was spending time on land. Look at this steep trend line. Now we're up in 30% or so, and if this trend continues, which it likely will, we're gonna see the majority of that polar bear population on land. So not only is more of the polar bear population coming on land, but they're spending more time on land. So again, the chart here shows the day is on shore, right here on this axis. So in the late uh, 80s, you know, maybe 10 days on shore. And if you follow that trend line up through all those different data points, you're looking at now 60 days, so over two months. And if this continues in another 40 years, they're gonna spend half the year on, sh on shore. So what does this mean for bears? What does it mean for people? Well, as they've been moving on shore, what we're also seeing is more of these mothers are denning on shore. They're spending more time uh, finding and digging their dens on shore. One of the reasons for this is because that sea ice, even if it is there in the winter, it's less stable than it used to be. So what does this mean for people? Well, I mean, it depends on your values and your perspective. You could say there's some benefits. There's been this boom in polar bear tourism, right? So maybe a new economic sector, especially in places like Kaktovik on the North Slope over the last couple of decades, you've seen a lot of tourists come up and, and see polar bear like very few other places on Earth. But this could also mean more conflict, right? So this is actually an aerial photo of the community of Kaktovik. And in the fall, they whale. They harvest bowhead whale. So this is a time of year when most of your polar bear are on shore anyways, but then when you harvest these bowhead whales and you pull it onto shore, you have the carcass that remains and you have anywhere from 30, 60, 70 polar bears in town. And so far coexistence has been pretty good, but certainly conflict does arise. So these are s sort of things that we have to consider. And of course, in addition to having our of in our communities on the North Slope, like Ukiagvik and Nuiqsut and Kaktovik and Wainwright, we also have our ever-expanding oil fields. So there is kind of the oil and gas road uh, system up there around Prudhoe Bay. And with a lot of this activity, and it's now expanded even to the west of Nuiqsut right there. You even have development over here right now. So there's a lot more activity. So you have polar bears coming on land, interacting with that activity. And associated with that activity, of course, you just have all sorts of other things going on beyond the infrastructure, beyond the facilities. You have more aircraft activity, everything like that. So the polar bear as a species was listed as threatened in 2012. So under the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act, they're required to also look after these bears. So they've lost their critical habitat. So thousands of years they've existed on sea ice and now we've seen this rapid change and they're forced to adapt to this new environment. So it's, it's our job to kind of give them uh, some room to adapt and make sure that not only we minimize conflict with people, but we minimize disturbance to them, right? But more information is needed on the type of disturbance and how to mitigate it. So for example, I mentioned there's a bunch of denning on land now. So one thing that we might want to think about is when we're putting in ice roads or doing seismic surveys in the winter, how do we avoid these dens, right? That's a critical time of year. You disrupt that denning period, the mother abandons the den, the cubs are probably not going to survive. So before industry can avoid these dens, they have to find them. So the background of this slide is the North Slope. 
Can you see the den? No, I can't either. Nobody can. So up there, if you visited, it's kind of this treeless, windswept area in the winter, right? Oftentimes there's cloud cover and there's kind of like this flat light even where you can't even differentiate between the land and the sky. So how do we find these dents? Well, there has been some technology developed. So this would be just the surface through the naked eye. Well, we realized a couple decades ago also that you could use thermal infrared to actually detect the heat that's emitted from these dents. So you can fly over them with a thermal infrared camera that is looking for that heat signature, that heat that's seeping up through the dent. And so that's a picture from a thermal infrared camera of the den location. Then you can process that to kind of identify exactly where it is. And then you can validate that. And we've done that um, with bear dogs and other ways to make sure that these hot spots that we're seeing are actual dens. So one research project that we worked on a few years ago is try to figure out what are the optimal conditions for going out and finding these bear dens. So what we did is we put a thermal infrared camera on one of these drones. And our research question was just to identify if industry or agencies like Alaska Department of Fish and Game are going to go out there and fly for these dens, when should they do it to give them the greatest chance of actually finding that den if it's out there? So whether it's the time of year, the temperature, the wind speed, cloud cover, and I just want to give a lot of credit to my former graduate student here, Nils Peterson, that helped lead this research. So here's how it worked. So we did have some live bears up there that we could go and fly over, but there was a pretty small sample size. And we wanted to get out there and fly under a lot of different conditions to figure out what is optimal. So what we ended up doing is actually creating artificial dents. We did this both for grizzly bears that dig into the earth for their den, and then polar bears, which mainly dig into the snow. And what we learned about their physiology is a grizzly bear is emitting about 60 watts of heat, and a polar bear about 120. So how many people have a um, oil pan heater or a battery blanket on their car so things don't freeze up? All right, most folks do. So we had one of those in the grizzly bear den and two of those <laughs> in the polar bear den. It worked. And we excavated these dens so they kind of align with what we see in real life. And we put the battery blankets on foam so the heat wouldn't go down but would dissipate up. And then we'd fly under all these kind of conditions to find out when we could when we could detect them. So what we found? Well, the optimal time to find these dens if you're using thermal infrared is the beginning of the season when you might have less snow load on top, right? During really cold days, so there's a big contrast between that hot spot area and the surrounding environment. Little to no wind because just the friction on the snow can kind of dissipate that heat signature and then also when there's not direct sunlight because just the reflection off that snow can also cause problems. So what we did is we identified, if you're gonna go, go out and fly, fly during these times, and that might optimize your opportunity to actually detect these bears and then help industry know where not to go to avoid them so they can den and raise healthy babies, okay? The other thing that I already briefly mentioned, of course, with all this oil activity and also researchers like me flying around and tourism and people just getting to their homes up there, there's a lot more aircraft activity than there used to be. It's steadily increased over the last 50 years, and they need more information to try to understand how aircraft actually disturb bear, because there's policies, they gotta make recommendations, how maybe aircraft operators should, should operate around these bears. So for this research was with another graduate student of mine, Gwen Quigley, who's actually rafting one of these beautiful rivers up there right now. Um, we flew along these coasts in an aircraft and uh, observed and, and did kind of an experiment on how these bears would respond to aircraft. So our research question is how spe specifically how does aircraft altitude affect the behavioral response of these polar bear when they're on shore. So we did this both in a fixed wing aircraft and a helicopter and what we do is we fly really high and find that bear and then we drop down and then we'd record how the bear is responding to that aircraft activity as we drop down. So this is kind of how it worked. We would start high, so on our initial approach, we wouldn't bother the bear, and then we would fly at different altitudes and see how it responded to find out if disturbance increases as altitude decreases. Does that all make sense? Okay, 
So here's just an animation to help us understand. <laughs> and what we're looking for is what is referred to as a take response under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So a take means that they kind of have a strong behavioral response to whatever that disturbance is. So a take could be an abrupt movement away from the aircraft. If the mother's nursing, it could be a, a stopping of the nursing or breaking up of a family group. If the bear's on land, it could flush into water. Or if it's just walking and it converts to running, those would all count as take response, okay? So that's what we're looking for. As we dropped our aircraft, we were looking for at what altitude it, that bear exhibits a take response. So we did 115 sample flights. Talk about super fun research, <laughs> but at the same time, it didn't feel good, kind of maybe harassing a, a threatened species. But uh, uh, just over a couple years doing this, we're able to set some regulations that might give these bears protections for generations. So there's some trade-offs here. So we conducted 115 sample flights. We did 57 bears with a fixed-wing aircraft, a small aircraft, a little Cessna, and then 58 with a helicopter. 75% of those flat flights resulted in a take response. So the bear exhibited a strong enough response to qualify as a take. For 25%, there's no take, so we went all the way down to 33 meters or 100 feet, and the bears did not exhibit a strong physical reaction, okay? So a little quiz time here. Do you think the bears were more sensitive to a helicopter or the fixed wing? Helicopter, raise your hand. Okay. Fixed wing? Sure. All right, there we go. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Diane. You're right. They were. So what we found is the probability to take rapidly increased with decreased flight altitude, as you expect. But they were certainly more sensitive to the helicopter than the fixed wing. For the helicopter, at 450 meters, so what is that, 16, 1,700 feet, they started to exhibit that. The probability of take uh, started, and then it increased exponentially, and I'll show you a graph in a little bit. But what was really cool about this work is we collaborated real closely with Fish and Wildlife Service. So one great thing about working closely with the policy or the decision makers, they uptake that science right away. So we're not just producing science that sits on the shelf for seven years. So they grab this stuff and that helps them um, inform their recommendations and they have defensible data backing up their decisions, which might result in less lawsuits and all sorts of good stuff like that. So here's some of the graphs that we prepared for them. So we actually modeled the probability of take at different altitudes. So you got your helicopter and your fixed wing, and down here is your altitude in meters. So as you can see with the helicopter, right around 450 meters, you started to see a steep rise in the probability of take. And when you got to, at least for active bears, which were more sensitive than inactive bears, um, when you got to around 300, the probability of take is really high. So it also depended what the bear was doing. If upon the approach it was already active, which means it's probably already alert, which made it more sensitive. And then we also found that there is a difference on whether it's on a barrier islands, like one of those little islands off the coast, or whether it was on the mainland. So we've tried to provide some other information that might help inform operators. You know, on the mainland they might be more sensitive, or on the barrier island they might be more sensitive. But this is what we came up with. And of course, there's our publication if you want more information. Okay, I'm going to stick around in the north. We can't leave the north yet until we talk about caribou, right? An iconic Arctic species. So in Alaska, we have 31 herds, right? And up on the north slope there is four of our biggest. So moving from left to right, you have the porcupine, the central Arctic, the Teshapuk, and then the western Arctic. Okay, so we'll kind of talk about those. But what I will say is just circumpolar wide, the outlook and the recent trends for caribou have not been great. If we look at these circumpolar Arctic herds, so we got Russia and Canada, doesn't capture Finland very well or, or Scandinavian countries. But we can see if you look at the, the gray is the, the maximum population estimate that we've been able to make over the years, the different researchers around the world. And then the black is the current population estimate. And what you will kind of see, and I highlighted in yellow, is there's actually only two of all of these herds 
that are at kind of the maximum extent. And the kind of the sad part of this story is many of these have declined significantly. If you look at like the George River here, it was knocking on the door of, geez, six, 800,000, and there's not much left. And we're seeing that in many different places. Caribou are difficult to study. They cycle naturally, and we don't really know what drives it, and we don't really know what is driving this decline. So we got a bunch of hypotheses, of course, and we think one of the leading hypotheses is climate change and how that's affecting their environment. And part of those climate changes that we're paying close attention to are what are called rain on snow or icing events. Have folks heard of this a little bit? You get these winters, you get this unseasonably warm temperatures where you might get some rain in the middle of winter on snow and then it freezes back up and it creates that crust layer. Sometimes you don't even need rain. It can just warm up and start to thaw and then refreeze and it creates that crust. Well, what we're seeing is more of these icing events. And you can kind of see here how some uh, scientists studied this about how different icing events created these crust layers that can actually lock up their forage and make it unavailable to them. So we think the frequency and the severity of these icing events are occurring and that may be contributing to some of these localized decline. And we're learning more about how to study that, figure out where it's occurring, when it's occurring, and what is the severity of that event through like satellite observations and remote sensing. And there's been some research that are starting to be able to quantify the frequency of these events which are occurring. Here's Alaska over here, so you're seeing like one severe event per winter, but then you get down farther south and you're seeing over here in like your Scandinavia countries where they do a lot of reindeer herding, you're getting up to 12 events a year, which can be really catastrophic. And this uh, affects all sorts of different um, species, your doll sheep and your mountain areas, your caribou, of course, and then musk ox. And then I'll just highlight one really severe event back in 2003 on on Banks Island, uh, an estimated 20,000 musk ox died of one severe icing event. So there has been documentation of some, some of the, these sort of things taking their toll on our wildlife. And of course, in those remote areas, you have communities that are very reliant on these species for all sorts of reasons. Okay, you ready to go to interior Alaska? So if we go down to interior Alaska, at least when I think about interior Alaskan boreal forests, some of the defining characteristics are, of course, moose and wildfire, right? Especially right across the Tanana River right now. We've got the McDonald fire burning away at 28,000 acres or so. Well, our wildfire regime has also been changing. So this chart here shows how wildfire size has changed since the 1950s. And really what you want to look at here is we got more of these big years, these red columns more recently, right? So more area burned, we're seeing more frequent fires, and in some cases, more severe fires. And in Canada last year, that was huge. That was their biggest season ever. 16.5 million hectares were burned. To put that in perspective, the average year, if you look at their historic record, is 2.5 million, so eight times bigger than the average. So most of the time when it comes to wildfire, it's a good thing for moose. It rejuvenates that environment, right? It kind of starts it over with early succession vegetation species like willow and shrubs that moose like. And there's been a lot of studying on how habitat for moose peaks after wildfire. And it's somewhere between 10 and 30 years, depending on what was there before and how severe that fire burned. So what are the impacts of wildfire and moose hunting? You know, this is a question that we haven't asked as researchers until recently, and it's an important one. So the green here is all the boreal forest, and we look at all the boreal forest of Alaska and Canada. You have somewhere around 400,000 moose hunters in that green, harvesting about 80,000 moose from a population of roughly a million. If we just go up to good old Alaska, we got 30,000 hunters harvesting somewhere around 75 100 from a population of 200,000. That is a lot of meat in the freezer, right? So why should we care? Well, there's a chance that these wildfires could displace moose, right? Or disrupt these hunting areas. Um, 
after you, if you've walked in a burn, maybe for morale mushrooms or something afterwards, you often see this slash. Or if you have an established ATV or snow machine trail, you can see how that the trees fall over and it can impede access. So that's one thing that could affect. It could just affect people's ability to get out of their hunting areas and ultimately potentially reduce hunting opportunity. And a decline in hunting opportunity can be a decline in the meat that communities are able to put away that can have real consequences on food security, uh, different cultural and traditional practices. And a lot of times I know not any individual one of us eats a whole moose by ourselves. We share that meat and the sharing process is really important to social cohesion up here. So our research objective with support from the National Science Foundation EPSCOR program and my co-authors Jen Smith who's at UAA and Tom Paraguay who's at Alaska Department of Fish and Game were to quantify the immediate effects of wildfire on moose harvest. I'm going to tell you what that means here in a moment. So we looked at all the different wildfires that have occurred uh, over the years here in Alaska, so the different colors are just different decades that that wildfire occurs. And we looked at all the locations that we've had a wildfire that year, and then there was a moose harvest in that same game management area. Actually, we looked at a smaller scale than that, but that harvest reporting area where we had both moose being harvested and a wildfire occurs, okay? So that was kind of our sampling unit. And we used all the wildfire and moose harvest data from 1984 to 2019. And what we did is we compared hunter numbers the year before, and then a wildfire would occur, and then we looked at the year after, right? So in the same area, what happened this year? Wildfire occurred, what did it look like after the wildfire, right? So kind of a, as, as much of a direct comparison as we could, and we looked at it whether it increased, decreased, or stayed the same. Then we also looked at things like wildfire size. Does the size of the wildfire matter? Does the location while the, where the wildfire occurred matter? So we also accounted for that in our modeling efforts. So just for example, so say, let's use the McDonald fire, which is still burning, right? Just south of us. We would look at what happened in that reporting area in 2023, and then you got the, the wildfire that's occurring right now, and then we compare this, these harvest metrics in 23 to 24. Everybody, uh, everybody ready? Okay, so what, what did we find? So who thinks that wildfire over those almost four decades increased harvest the next year? No? Okay, how many people think it, it decreased moose harvest? Okay, there's some people that aren't raising their hands. <laughs> and you're smart for not doing that. We found no significant effect. I'm going to tell you why in a little bit. So no significant effect. So if you got that right, congrats. And if you didn't, humbly accept your failure. So look at these numbers. So this is pooling all those different wildfires that we looked at, which was over 1,800. It was almost exactly the same. So this is the number of hunters in those reporting areas. So the mean was 38.66 and 38.64. And then if you look at kills per year, again, very similar. Just no evidence of a big effect of wildfire. So do you think wildfire size mattered? I'm losing you now because I'm tricking everybody. I understand that. So did wildfire size matter? Yes. Okay, two, three, four, five. No. Nobody's going to. So maybe. Okay, all right, sometimes maybe we're right. Okay, let me unpack this figure here. We got the mean number of moose hunters. So in our small fires, which is a lot of them, most of these things are little, or we put them out before they can get even to medium. It was only in these very large fires that we saw what would be some sort of statistical difference between moose hunter numbers the year before and the year after a wildfire. But I do want you to look carefully at this. That's only 28 of a sample size of 1872. And to be a large wildfire, at least the way that we kind of classified this, 40% of that harvest reporting area had to burn. Okay, so this is mean number of kills. Again, really finding it only in those very large fires. And I just want to draw your attention to, if we look at all the fires that have occurred all those years, 
we're only seeing an effect in 1.5% of our wildfires. So it doesn't matter where the burn, and we did find a little bit of effect, of course, on the size, but then also if there was a large burn near a road, it seemed to have a bigger impact. And that makes sense, because it was probably affecting access from maybe the roads and the trails in that area, or a per perceived effect on access. So why such an insignificant effect? Well, I do have some plausible explanations, which is nice. One of those is moose are just really resilient to wildfire. If uh, you know a little bit about moose history, they traveled across Beringia around 12, 14,000 years ago at the end of the Little Ice Age, right? So when they kind of traveled over, is about the same time as the boreal forest as we know it today began to take shape. So really this forest and these moose have evolved together. There's been a lot of generations of moose that have experienced wildfire. I think they know what they're doing and continuing to thrive. The other thing to think about is the habitat that moose prefer in the boreal forest is just generally less flammable. So a lot of the wildfires maybe are not occurring where you're seeing a lot of your moose. So you think, especially during, during the summer, right, when we're getting these wildfires, these moose are around lakes or around liver, rivers or in uh, shrubby or deciduous habitat, which is just less flammable compared to your black spruce, right? So your good moose habitat isn't burning. And even if you do have these burns, you know, you got the, the wildfire uh, the outside of that polygon, but there's a lot of areas in there that don't burn. So there's sanctuary left where they can kind of move and probably stay free of, of some of those really negative effects of that wildfire. The third reason is this good moose hunting habitat is also less flammable. Naturally, if you're a smart hunter, you're going where the moose are. And the moose are less flammable habitat. And a lot of our hunters in Alaska, if they're not on the road system or the trail system, they're out on navigable waterways and some are flying into areas. But what's also, so you got less flammable kind of areas along the river, but the other thing to think about is those folks that might be using the road system or trails, most of your moose hunting is occurring maybe on the road system or around communities, and that's also where you're seeing some of the most wildfire suppression. So a lot of these wildfires can't seem to get probably to the size that they could have those big effects on that moose population. So the take home message from this, there's all sorts of things to worry about in this world and for managers to think about. It's kind of nice to find one that we don't have to. So the take home message is, is uh, no immediate effects right now. It's probably worth monitoring. Just because we can't find evidence of effect doesn't mean that wildfires aren't challenging hunters. They probably certainly are. It just might suggest that at this time hunters are able to overcome or adapt to those challenges. But there's other things beyond wildfire with climate change that are affecting moose. So you do also just have warmer seasonal temperatures, right? Warmer falls. And we've seen some news articles in Alaska like this one that's the headline reads, warm weather meant tough hunting in GMU's 17B and 7NC. And then we're also seeing, this is the Board of Game proposal book. So the Board of Game is, are the folks that set the hunting regulations for Alaska, they've been receiving more and more proposals about potentially moving the regulated moose hunting season to better align with environmental conditions. Because it's getting warmer in the fall, some folks are saying maybe we should try to move it back or be more flexible to these erratic weather conditions. So Tessa, another one of my graduate students, this is Tessa Hasbrook. After she finished, she's now a researcher with ADF and G down in Southeast Alaska. She looked at the effects of temperature, leaf drop, and water levels during the fall on moose harvest. So why look at these? Well, I'll get into high temperatures in more detail, but the water levels thing is really an access issue. If you think about all the people that run the Yukon River, the Tanana, some of them might hunt on that main river channel, but a lot of them actually get off on smaller tributaries or back in these sloughs, and during really war low water levels, they can have access blocked to some of those kind of prime hunting areas. And we've heard that. I've had the privilege of working with a lot of indigenous communities in remote Alaska over the years, and this is something that's came up about fluctuation in water levels and not being able to get to areas that they used to, uh, or at least not as predictable and reliable as they used to. So with the high temperatures, there's been quite a bit of research on this in maybe the last 10 years, especially in Scandinavia, tracking at how moose are responding to these warm temperatures. We got this big 
animal that actually begins to get like heat stressed at 55 degrees Fahrenheit. And of course we have a lot of days over that. But what they found in some of this research is when you have those warm fall days, they're seeking cooler cover and just becoming less active. There's also evidence that they're switching to more nocturnal behavior when it is cooler. And when they're in these thicker areas, these cooler areas, with warmer temperatures, leaf drop may be occurring later, which if you're out there moose hunting, what happens after that nice hard freeze with a little bit of wind? Your leaves drop and you can see into the woods a lot better. So there's also a sightability issue that we're thinking about with this temperature. So less active, more nocturnal, potential for decreased sightability. So Tess published the paper here in Wildlife Biology, but the take home messages from her work is that a one meter decrease in water levels, so we, live, we measure these at different river gauges, decreased daily harvest up to 25%. So say that in a given area you might have 40 moose harvested on the day, that would mean that you're having 30 if during a really low water level year. So it's something for managers to take into account if they're not getting the harvest they expected, because what can happen if harvest is really low or people aren't seeing moose? <coughs> Who might get blamed first for that A after the managers themselves? Predators. Predators, yeah. So we can think about these other effects that might alter some of this harvest. And then with regards to temperature, a one Celsius increase in temperature, especially during the mid and later hunting seasons, so as the moose are going into rut, also resulted in a daily decrease of harvest of up to 7%. So we did find some weather-related effects on moose harvest that we can account for now, but also continue to monitor as things are probably going to continue to change. All right. Now, I want to leave plenty of time for talking. I do have another thing that we can talk about if we need to, but I want to talk about one thing that I think that might be one of the larger threats to moose and moose hunting in Alaska. And, I, and I'm talking about the future here, so I got... <laughs> My son Knox here, he got this cool new snow machine helmet when he's two, and he liked it enough that he'd take it on walks with him, and I just think it's really cute, and I think, when I look at it, I think about the future. But when I think about what might be some of the threats to moose and moose hunting over time is actually parasites and disease. As we're getting warmer, this is becoming a more hospitable environment for things that aren't here yet, but if they get here, they could have bad effects. So one of these is the moose winter tick. Has anyone heard about this? Okay. It's having already a big effect in places like Minnesota and Maine, right? But some of the carriers of moose winter tick are mule deer. And mule deer right now already have an established population in the Yukon Territory. So there's Dawson, their white horse. So they're already knocking on Alaska's door. And some of the preliminary research that has gone on in the Yukon Territory has shown that as many as 30% of these mule deer are carrying a winter tick. So they're there and they're probably coming. And the problem is, is mule deer seem to do okay with them, but they get on moose and you have real problems. They get really infested, result in hair loss, and can have effect on their physiology and their fitness. So does anyone know why moose don't do well with these winter tick where mule deer can tolerate them? Mule deer are good self-groomers. So they're able to groom those ticks off and they even groom each other. So somehow they can keep them at a tolerable level where moose are not grooming themselves the same way so they can really get infested and explode and they don't have much of a chance uh, to reduce that load. So that's one thing you need to be thinking about. If you're a hunter or a non-hunter, it doesn't matter if you see a mule deer and there is getting to be some evidence of this. Um, people have hit them actually with their car uh, over by Toke. Um, it's good to report that to managers so they can monitor the situation and maybe ramp up their surveillance program to try to get ahead of this if it does get here. The other thing I want to bring to your attention is in addition to mule deer moving up through Alberta, British Columbia, and the Yukon, we also have white-tailed deer. Now one thing white-tailed deer, and I really like white-tailed deer, I did my masters on them in Minnesota a long time ago, so I appreciate them, but they are the cockroach of the large mammal world. <laughs> the reason I say that is they just thrive in any environment and they out-reproduce everything around them, it seems like. But one of the other adaptations that they have is they can get this meningeal worm, also known as brain worm, and be just fine. But if this gets into moose, it causes problems and usually results in death. 
So if you have white-tailed deer moving up, mingling with uh, moose or caribou, you could really introduce a problem. Um, when you get brainworm in moose, it's also called uh, twirling disease, where you see a moose kind of no longer show fear, but kind of walking in circles and hanging its head to the right. So there's evident signs of it. But it's another thing to, to keep track of, where if you see a mule deer or a white-tailed deer, it's just good to report it and let folks know so we can monitor the situation. And then there's other things that are not up here, like CWD, which is great, but it, it certainly could come. So the disease and the parasite thing is, is definitely worth paying attention to, especially with our climate-related changes. So I got, I'm good on time, so we can open up to questions now. Otherwise, I can talk about one more thing that's related to our ability to actually <coughs> estimate moose population size. Do you want me to talk about that, or do you want to just dive into questions? Estimating moose? Questions? Okay. Okay, we're going to... Oh, and, and because of these sort of issues, they were candidates for listing, or at least it went under a review by the Endangered Species Act down in Minnesota in 2016. They actually found that it's probably not warranted to be listed at the time. One of the reasons for it, even though that population in Minnesota isn't doing very good, right to the north of them in Canada, that population is really strong, so there's still opportunities for colonization to the south. We won't get to that. That's a cool picture, but I'll get back. One other climate-related change, we all, when we think about changes in our environment, changes in things like snow conditions, we think about the effects on wildlife. What we don't think about as much is our ability to actually monitor wildlife. So how is it affecting our traditional monitoring programs? So one thing that has been getting increasingly affected by our changing seasonality is our ability to conduct fall moose surveys. So across most of Alaska, how we estimate moose population size is in the fall, after there's adequate snow cover, you go out and you fly these systematic aerial surveys to count moose. You need that snow because of why? See them, they're brown. So he creates this contrast, right? So they wait till you got sufficient snow, you go out and fly and you gotta finish by December 15th. So you kind of got this window where you need good snow, but then you're, you can't do it after December 15th. Why can't you do it after December 15th? Getting too dark. You don't have enough daylight hours to conduct the survey, but what's the other reason? Antler drop. Very good. So in addition to just counting moose up there, they're also getting composition. They're getting the, the, the gender, the sex ratios, age structure, things like that. When the antlers drop, that can be really difficult. So you got this narrow window of time. And what's happening is later and later each year, uh, the, the snow is arriving and accumulating and being sufficient for adequate detention. So the agencies are worried about this. So we dove into it to look at how snow conditions are changing and what the outlook is for these traditional fall moose surveys into the future. So there's a moose there. It's kind of modeled. It's not the best condition. It's the only one I had. So the moose managers were concerned that there's insufficient, unpredictable snow con conditions for this detection issue to go out and get reliable counts. If you can't get a reliable count, you have poor population estimates. And if you're not really sure how many moose are out there, or what the bull cow ratio is, it can be difficult to set harvest regulations. And as a moose manager, you're probably going to err on the side of caution to avoid over harvest. Erring on the side of caution means probably less permits, less hunter opportunity. So I'm going to just zoom right to the results. What we did is we looked at how snow conditions are changing over time, how they've changed since the 1980s until today, looked at those trends, and then kind of use that trend line to see how they might change in the future. And let me try to explain this figure. With our modeling, we estimated the number of years into the future when this fall survey technique is likely going to be impossible or at least not reliable enough to count on. So the dark blue here right here means that in the next 10 years, the chances of really relying on these traditional surveys is going to be pretty difficult. As you get into the interior, you still have some areas that are, you got 30, maybe 40 years. And then the stuff in the gray is either not moose habitat or it looks like given our best snow models, 
that things are still going to be okay after another 40 years. So what do we do with this? Right now, it's just an opportunity for managers to maybe be proactive and plan. Think about the way things are changing. If this trend doesn't continue, what do we do? What sort of new monitoring techniques can we develop where we can still get reliable, good estimates of our moose populations? Okay, so I'm going to go back then to thank you. And just in case you're wondering where the biggest moose in the world is, it's right here, which is north of Oslo, Norway, about two hours. And then this is me and my wife, Aaliyah, standing up there. We got a sabbatical in Norway, so we actually lived in the town that was about 10 miles to the south of this. But this is not pretty. That's really cool. We should have one of those. We should make it bigger. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't want to do that to Alaska or to Norway, because then Texas will make one even bigger. <laughs> Okay, um, I'd love to thank you again for your time and attention and if you've got any questions or discussion.